Welcome to The Fix List, a guide to improving your paintings by looking at other work in search of common visual problems. Today's problem is the line of action, and actually also focal point. Now, the reason I say both of those is because really they're inseparable. If you imagine an archer, they have the arrow that they fire, and they fire it at a target. In this scenario, the target would be the focal point, the arrow would be the line of action. And the fun thing is, even if they haven't fired the arrow yet, you understand that if they've aimed it at the target, that's what's going to happen. We are using an implied line in the image to direct the reader's eye. So let's try that on some examples from the Control Paint community. This is a great one. We've got a rider on a horse who's looking off another horizon, and presumably he's looking at something. This is the line of action. So. If I diagram it, we can see he's looking kind of in this direction, but then there's also some other lines that point along with it. Here we have kind of receding parallel lines. This is good. They're pointing off towards, oh, actually they're not really pointing at anything. What I'm getting from this is that he sees something cool that we, the audience, don't. This is what I did instead. And if we look at the diagram, we can see that there is a general swirling motion. This is sort of a take on the rule of thirds or the golden mean, where not only are we pointing at something interesting, which in this case is an arch, but the way that we get there is a number of different lines implied through my shadow choices and my choice of objects. So I could have put this shadow here anywhere, but I decided to use the edge of the shadow as a line that leads to the focal point. So we have the line of action which are these sort of swirling shapes. And then we have the focal point, which is where they're leading to. It really helps if you ever have a character to have the character looking at the same thing you want the audience to look at. So we have character's gaze, we have some implied lines, all of it points towards the focal point. This one is the same idea, but a little bit trickier. As we can see with the diagram, we have a bunch of lines all pointing straight up and down, specifically this troublesome one right in the center. And then we have kind of a horizontal ground plane and the rabbit. I'm assuming the rabbit is our subject. So he should be the focal point. If you notice his eyes actually pointing off screen, that's kind of an issue as well. But anyway, we want to point visual arrows of some sort at the rabbit. Let's give it a try. This is what I came up with. Now you'll notice these arrows don't point directly at him like the previous example. What they do though is they all imply a sense of perspective that kind of leads the eye down towards almost this spotlight. If we see in the original image the ground is sort of evenly lit. Here I have created arrows that point down towards a spotlight. The spotlight is using lighting although the arrows are just the tree trunks themselves. And so between those two elements, it's impossible to look anywhere but in this circle. So the trees pull the eye down, you have a spotlight, and the highest contrast is where the rabbit is sitting. And then just to <laughs> do one little extra detail, I've moved the rabbit's eye, so he's kind of pointing into the spotlight as well. Totally not necessary, but the point is we have before, where it's not necessarily clear where we're supposed to be looking, and then we have after, where I've used compositional shapes to draw the eye down towards where I want them to go. I love this photo study. It's a really nice take on that tricky texture of bird feathers. What I think it lacks though is something to look at. Obviously we're looking at the bird, but the bird is looking off screen and the background is not doing a great job framing the bird. Now my guess is because they were looking at a photo, and probably what they did was pretty accurately copy the leaves from the photo. Well, what we're doing as artists is imagining something that doesn't exist. So even when you're doing studies, you can rearrange stuff. What I've done with my take on it is to rearrange leaves such that they all point directly at the focal point. Here we can see the arrows. And I want to compare this against what the original was. So if we look back at the original and put a diagram on it, here you can see there's sort of a linear quality to each of these leaves. Just based on the texture that the leaves have, they almost feel like directional arrows pointing at something. 
But as you can tell by the diagram, they're not really all pointing at any one thing. They're just sort of randomly placed around. With my take on it, I contrive them and I force them all to point in sort of an unnatural direction. But between the shapes of the shadows, which I also placed intentionally, and the veins in the leaves, it gives this framing element where all of the directional lines in the image bring the eye back to the focal point. So had you never seen the original image and didn't know what the leaves behind the bird looked like, you might not notice anything special about this. It would just feel pretty well framed. And that's the secret about all this stuff. It's essentially invisible until you know what to look for. I just have a background to put on here, so why not make it to my advantage? I think this one's great. This is a really interesting interior sci-fi space. It's got great perspective, good sense of scale and atmosphere, but it has nothing to look at. Remember, there's an archer and a target. This one doesn't really have a target. So with my take on it, all I did was change the lighting. What I did was to diminish the light coming in from these windows up on top of the screen and enhanced light that wasn't there in the first place to just call out attention to this door. Now, what is this door? I'm not sure exactly I didn't make this design, but what a difference this makes. Here, it's a space. We don't really have anything to focus on. Here, now we made a painting about something. You follow the light up these stairs and imagine yourself going through this doorway. It gives you an entry point. In this case, it's a literal entry point, but it allows the viewer to connect with the space because you're giving them a target, something to look at before and after. So along those lines, I want to finish up with one of my paintings. This is kind of a long hallway with a ornate doorway. The problem though is that once you get to this focal point, everything is clearly pointing at the doorway, then it's not really anything. It's kind of this curving stairwell that goes off into who knows what. What a waste. This is an archer shooting a whole bunch of arrows at no target. So what I did was I gave myself just something to look at. Pretty simple. You can see even at a distance, it gives you a much better sense of a real place. We have a, a throne room with a chandelier and you know a little bit of light peeking through on these windows. So it's not hard to paint this. It was no harder to add this than it was to add the stairs. But if we look at before and after, the image becomes about something. The focal point really is a payoff for the lines of action. Because you need both parts. You need the line of action and the focal point. Neither one works on its own. So hopefully these examples have given you a starting point to start improving your own paintings. And I want to thank the brave audience members that sent in their art to help with this project. It's not easy to get your work critiqued, so thanks for the help. See you in the next video.